Welcome to Torah on the Go. Whether you are on your Peloton or walking your dog or sitting in traffic, we are glad that you're taking the time to learn with us and to spend time with me and my rabbi spouse, Rabbi Feinstein. Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, that's what Blair says too um, when I introduce her as my spouse. So uh, here we are, and tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. So let's start out at a more serious note, and then uh, and then perhaps we'll end by talking about our favorite Hanukkah songs. There are three blessings for Hanukkah, and the middle one is Bayamim uh, Mahem Uvazman Hazeh. Uh, in those days at this time, or in these days at those times, however you want to say, but there's a connection in some way between the time of the Maccabees and this time. And it feels like this year there's an even greater connection with the fact that we are actually engaged in struggle as a Jewish people. Yeah. We're engaged in a struggle in Israel and we're engaged in a struggle here in the United States and in the diaspora. And as we light the candles tonight, we are in many ways invoking the strength of the Maccabees, how does that blessing feel to you this year differently than previous years, or does it feel differently at all? Of course it feels differently, because we've been through a catastrophe that is uh, whose resonance we haven't even begun to understand. But to look at, look at this in a broader context, the rabbis of the tradition understood that Hanukkah was a time of miracles. The Farsemetanes, to announce to the world that we are the recipients of a miracle. And I've always taught my kids that we have to add another phrase to the end of the bracha. It's not Sha'asa Nisim Lavotenu that God did miracles for our ancestors by Amima Hemba's Manazeh at this time of year long ago. I always add the words Ubi Amenu Anu, because, which means in our time as well. Yes, right now the state of Israel is embattled and broken, but there's a state of Israel that after 1,800 years of diaspora, we have the honor of living in the moment when Jews have returned to sovereignty, returned to history, and returned to power. That we live in a country in America that has welcomed us as no diaspora has ever welcomed us before, and that we have found wells of creativity, of cultural and religious creativity, that are unimaginable in the course of Jewish history. And so I, I like to think of Hanukkah as a reminder of the miracles, not just then, but the miracles now. It, it's, that's a terrific point. And it makes me think, and I don't know that many people think about this, that um, there in fact has not been Jewish sovereignty between the Maccabees and the modern state of Israel. That is a longer losing streak than the Chicago Cubs. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the, 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 the Maccabees for 2,000 years of diaspora reminded us that it was possible, mm -hmm. inspired in us a strength to, to um, one day um, take hold of our future the future of our people ourselves. Yes, but they also reminded us that we lost it. And we lost it not because we were conquered. We weren't conquered. What happened was is that five generations after Judah Maccabee led us in this war and established Jewish sovereignty, his great-great-great-grandchildren, or his, his nephews actually, right. Aristobulus and Hercules, f fought a civil war against each other for the power of ruling over Jerusalem, and they both appealed to Rome to come in on their side, and Rome did them the favor. Rome came in, Pompey entered the city of Jerusalem. Some sources say that the city of Jerusalem opened its gates to him. Better to have a foreign king who will bring peace and order than the civil war that was being fought. So the lesson isn't just that we have the capacity for sovereignty, but we also have a deep detriment when it comes to self-government. We are not good at this. And we have to be exquisitely careful about how we care for each other and how we govern this sovereignty and this community. Right. Most of us, when we travel around Israel today in modernity, outside the window of our tour bus, we're constantly being paraded to sites built by Herod the Great. Yeah. Now, Herod is the heir of the Hasmonean dynasty, yet he inhabits only the worst traits of the Hasmoneans. 
And we can ask ourselves, how did we get to Herod? How did we get to this architect that was willing to kill and slaughter in order to build these great um, idols uh, of architecture for himself? I mean, you, when you visit the Temple Mount, when you visit Masada, when you visit Caesarea, when you visit the aqueducts, wherever you take pictures throughout Israel, you're either looking at uh, Bauhaus architecture of the, of, the, of the 30s, 40s, 50s, or you're looking at Herod the Great. Basically, there's not a whole lot else in terms of architectural design. Hanukkah is the story not only of our strength and our autonomy, it's also of the kind of slow demise that occurs when we don't keep our eye on the ball. When we forget that we belong to each other. That's right. One of the miracles of this moment, and of course this is a moment of intense catastrophe and intense pain. If you know anyone in Israel, you've talked to them, you know what they're going through. But one of the most remarkable things that happened was that for about eight months, Millions of Israelis were protesting against this government, hundreds of thousands in the street every Saturday night. And on the dime, on one moment, that protest movement turned to a moment of mutual support. All of the division, all of the argument, all of the controversy was set aside. And right. the country has come together with such a solidarity, a power of solidarity that is unknown in our experience. And what's so wonderfully, painfully ironic is that Achim Beneshek, that movement of young Israeli soldiers and reservists who were protesting the government, turned into the support organization to protect the communities in the South and to bring them welfare and wel welfare powers of, uh, of healing and help. That the, when, when we need to, when our family is under attack, we, we can see each other again as family and protect each other. That's the miracle of this moment, of this Hanukkah. That's right. And I'm really proud that the VBS Israel Emergency Fund has, in fact, supported Achim Beneshek a, a great deal. How did the Maccabees become the Maccabees? I, this is a class that I, that I teach because, because it's easy to say, well, they had a father, Mattathias, who um, was the, the franchise owner of the temple in the city of Modi'in, and he didn't like for his franchise to be taken over by the Assyrian Greeks in the same way that the, that the, that the mothership in, in Jerusalem was, was taken over. He didn't like those rules, and so he told his five sons to join. But that's actually not when the Maccabees became the Maccabees. The Maccabees fought valiantly and they beat the Assyrian Greeks in a war that nobody thought they could take. But actually, in the book of Maccabees, and, and towards the end of the first book, there's a moment where they have, in fact, purified the temple. They've conquered Jerusalem without, ver without much help from anybody outside of their family. And there's a call from the north, from Jews living in the Galil, for them to come help them, that they're still under attack. The Assyrian Greeks have not stopped the war. They've lost Jerusalem, but they didn't stop. Now, there's no reason why the Maccabees should think that they defend the Jews of the far north. The Jews of the far north did absolutely nothing to help the Maccabees win the war. And yet, Judah Maccabee decides to send the army north to protect those Jews because they are, in fact, Am Yisrael, because we're family. I, I think that the broader cultural issue to me really speaks to me, especially as an American Jew. The reason why Mattathias went to war against the Greeks was because the culture around him offended his sensibilities. And the question that the, the really deep and, and in many ways painful question that Hanukkah asks us is, what are the parts of the culture that surrounds us that we find difficult to accept? I, I ask this to my teenagers and uh, I get wonderful answers. I say to them, is there anything in the culture, anything around us that you wish your little brother or sister didn't need to know, didn't experience, didn't take into themselves. What are they saying? And the kids will say some wonderful things. When kids said, the culture of acquisition and consumption. I wish my, my little sister wasn't so obsessed with makeup and clothes. I wish my little brother didn't want so many video games. I wish we could sit at the table and talk as a family without cell phones, they told me. Um, I wish that the movies that little kids see weren't so violent and so pain. These kids are so exquisitely tuned in right. to the culture outside and to the pernicious aspects, the dangerous, the poisonous aspects of that culture. That was the great question of Hanukkah. What is it in that outside culture that we have to push away? Even if it's attractive to us, we have to push it away because it's simply not good for the quality of our souls. My own children talk about TikTok. 
mm. in a very conflicted way because they feel like they know that it's bad for them. They know that it's being run by people who aren't supportive of us. And at the same time, they feel as though if they don't engage in it, they'll be social outcasts. Mm -hmm. This is the question, just like you explained. This is the, this is the, the, it epitomizes the question of how do we participate in a culture when we know that it's not good for us? And now um, we pivot to the, to the end to, to, to make Hanukkah, of course, joyous. I wish I could shove a sufganiya through the, through the microphone into your mouth, um, uh, give you a taste of what Hanukkah tastes like. But eight days of oil in one sitting. That's, that's what a, <laughs> a sufganiya. Right. Sufganiya, for those of you who are, who are, who are uh, part of the culture, is a, a jelly donut. It's the Israeli version of Hanukkah food. It's a jelly donut stuffed with raspberry uh, jam. Now there's stuff with chocolate and all sorts of things. All sorts of good stuff. And uh, yeah. it's uh, it's it's for if you're on the Peloton, stay there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest innovation in Judaism in, in 2,000 years I saw was in Israel. They serve now sufganiyot, jelly donuts, and you along with the jelly donut, you get a syringe filled with extra jelly because you <laughs> always get parts of the donut that don't have enough jelly in it. So you can take the syringe and either shoot it in the jelly or you can do what my kids do, which is to take the syringe and just shoot it straight into your mouth. And that's and that's Happy Hanukkah. That, there's nothing that says Happy Hanukkah like kids sucking jelly out of out of the out of the plastic syringe. The brilliance of the Jewish the brilliance mind. Is, yeah, right. So favorite Hanukkah song? Um, well, the first thing I have to say is, is, is I, I happen, if I can confess this online, um, I happen to be an affinditio of the Christmas songs. Uh -huh. um, so in the car, uh, I, I, I drive my family crazy because I love these songs. I went to public school as a kid. So I actually yeah. am one of the few Jews in the world who knows all the words to these songs. All the great Christmas songs were written by Jews. So yes. you don't have to and, feel bad. And the problem is that when I sing them, they all come out sounding Hasidic. Okay. So I've offered Herschel Fox, who's our gifted cantor, uh -huh. one day we're going to record a, a, a an album of uh -huh. Hasidic Christmas carols, uh -huh. the ideal gift for families of mixed heritage. So, uh -huh. you know, it's like, ya, die, 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 die. Yeah, bye 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 bye. Yeah, bye bye bye. It it works. It works. So, what's your favorite Hanukkah song? Go ahead. My favorite Hanukkah song is one that we sing in our family that nobody knows, and it's about uh, my mom used to sing it to us about Judah Maccabee's mother. It, it goes. Um, oh, she uh, mixed she them. She mixed and it, fixed, fixed them, them, and poured it into a bowl. You may not guess, but it was the latkes that made great Judah. His soul, you may not guess, but it was the latkes that gave great Judah his soul. Right. Um, we're contractually bound to not sing because it makes the cantors nervous uh, for their for their uh, um, for their jobs. But but uh, if you enjoyed that song, um, please stay tuned because the album is coming your way. Valley Beth Shalom rabbis present. Hanukkah songs and Hasidic Christmas carols. Hanukkah uh, songs you don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> on, on behalf of myself and Rabbi Feinstein and the entire clergy at VBS. What do you put on latkes? Sour cream. Sour cream. Sour cream. You're chocolate. an applesauce guy? Applesauce or chocolate syrup. Chocolate syrup. Wow. I did not. I, I did not know chocolate syrup was That's an option. That's American assimilation. That's right. <laughs> I do sour cream, applesauce, sugar, sugar Sal everywhere. Sugar salsa, salsa. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's the Southwest version. Right. Exactly. The Los Angeles version. There yeah. You go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we want to wish you a happy, happy Hanukkah, Chag Sameach, and we look forward to learning with you next time. Gather in the miracles; they matter. Mm -hmm.